Hello, everyone. You won't believe how happy I am to share that I finally have a working prototype that'll erase this Winbond W27C512EPROM with a 14V erase signal and then immediately program it with the same code that's on the ROM in the 65 Arduino up here. Essentially making the thing self-replicating with cheap cheap EPROMs. I was worried it was going to be too slow on a 6502 processor running at 1MHz when the commercial TL8662 Plus I have off to the side here takes about 30 seconds to program the whole ROM, but as it turns out, my breadboard programmer here is even faster. As you can see when I run the code, it only takes a little over a second to clone the ROM, much of which is just outputting text, and I have to say that's much better than I was expecting. But of course, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you feel like you missed something, you'd be absolutely right, as in the last video we left off like this. With a circuit just capable of generating the needed 14 volt erasure voltage and control signals to erase the ROM. And before that, we took a dive into how our voltage boost regulator works and the pitfalls of using one on a breadboard. If you'd like to know everything about how this circuit works, be sure to check out those videos too. Controlling all the signal lines of a whole ROM chip like this directly with a simple UNO style host system obviously isn't possible since just handling the 16 address lines would quickly gobble up basically all the IO pins, not leaving anything to control the remaining 12 pins on the ROM. A common trick to get more output pins out of an Arduino style dev board is to use shift registers, like the 74HC595 I have here on an unrelated PS2 to parallel adapter I made. The good thing about using shift registers is that you can turn three IO pins into an abominable amount of output pins, as you can chain together as many of these as you like without spending any more precious IO pins. They do come with a downside though. Since shifting bits out is a serial process, it means we have to set the next data bit and then toggle a pin on and off for every single bit we want to output. And if you want to change just a single bit, we have to shift out every single other bit again. On a 1 MHz 6502, that's about as fast as a herd of snails riding on a glacier. Instead, I am going for something many times faster that still only costs one controller pin for each additional eight pins we want to control. This 74HC573. It's an octal D-type transparent latch, meaning it'll pass 8 bits to its outputs and keep them there when the load pin goes from high to low. In other words, it's an 8-bit register. Since it only latches the 8 values when the load pin goes low, we can share the 8 input pins with as many of these as we want. And if I squeeze things together a bit, it looks like we can fit 3 of them. Since we don't need to latch the data for the ROM, we can just use two for the 16-bit address bus and the third one for extra control signals and maybe even more address lines for the bigger ROM later. To make the registers fit, I'll clean up the circuit a bit and move the 14 volt driver circuit a little bit out of the way. To get some more outputs to control the ROM, let's start by hooking up power and ground for each IC and add a 100 nanofarad capacitor for each IC. It's better practice to put the capacitor close to the IC, but I doubt we'll run into trouble with these ICs. Since they all share the same input lines, but just latch at different times, we can connect all the input pins together. So let's hurry up and do that. Since we might want to use this for 32 pin ROMs later, I'll move the W27C512 all the way to the edge of the breadboard. That way we have room to connect a 32 pin ROM without moving anything around, since all the bottom pins will usually line up correctly like that. After that, I'll hurry up and hook up the data bus of the ROM to the same lines again. That works because the ICs won't be active at the same time. With that out of the way, we can start connecting the address lines from A0 to A15, taking up two of the three registers. For convenience and shorter lines, I'll use the two closest to the ROM. The only thing out of the ordinary is the A9 address line, which we need to be able to put up to 14 volts on when we erase the chip. So we can't just hook it up to the register without letting out the magic smoke eventually. To solve that, I connect it to the register through a Schottky diode and add a pull-down resistor. That way, the register can still pull A9 to close to 5 volts when it needs to, and when we pull it to 14 volts with a transistor, the diode blocks it from reaching the register. Since neither signal can pull the pin to ground, we need 
the resistor to pull it down when nothing is driving it. Now to drive the 16 address lines of the ROM, we just need to latch the bottom 8 address bits to one register and the upper ones to the other. We also need to drive the output enable or VPP pin to 14 volts, so we also connect that to the 65 Arduino using a shot key and a pull down. Even though we saved quite a few pins by multiplexing the address and data bus of the ROM, we still won't have enough for all the control signals. But luckily, we have the third register for that. So let's just call that the control register. Intentionally, I've put the signals that don't change so often on the control register, since that'll impact speed a lot less than the chip enable signal, for instance, which we, by the way, hook up next. Of course, the most important speed trick here is to keep all 8 bits of our bus on the same I.O. register. Just like on the Arduino Uno, I've made sure the digital 0 to 7 pins are on the same I.O. register on the 65 Arduino. So let's connect the registers and the ROM data bus to those. That has the major benefit that we don't have to do any bitwise arithmetic to align bits with pins when writing them, but can just write a whole byte at a time from the 6502 CPU to data register A of the 6532 with a single instruction. And for an Arduino Uno's at Mega328, that would be port D. Of course, we still have to toggle the latches for each register, slowing things down a bit, but it's certainly a lot better to toggle once per 8 bits than 32 times every time we change a single bit, like we'd need using shift registers. And with that in place, we should have the hardware ready to read what's on the ROM from the 65 Arduino. If you're new to the channel, you might wonder what a 65 Arduino is. It's a super retro development board that'll do a lot of the things you usually do with an Arduino. But actually, it has more in common with an Atari 2600 from the 70s or Nintendo Entertainment System from the 1980s than an Arduino. Since it's got a 6502 processor and a 6532 riot chip at the business end, and a ROM chip containing the code that would be on a cartridge for the consoles. A little while back, I gave away about 35 motherboards for this little 8 bit marvel, but of course, they disappeared in a few hours. You can still buy the ICs and board as a kit from my website, or just make your own. The project is fully open source, just like this add on, and you'll find all the code and design files on my GitHub. Speaking of code, the last time I talked about the 6502 assembly code for the 65 Arduino, we implemented serial flow control, which is now a little bit in the way. Since the hardware flow control uses pins, we now need to control the ROM programming and the software flow control we don't really need either. I could plug it in and see what happens, but first we better make sure DRB and DRA initializes to a sane state so we don't short the ROM data lines to DRA or anything like that. Maybe I should make it software selectable with a define, but for now I'm just going to make sure it doesn't interfere by commenting it out. Other than that, I also made the serial baud rate selectable. At least you can divide 9600 by 2 as many times as you like and it should work. I have a feeling that's not the only changes coming in this video, so if you stop watching now, don't be surprised if the code on GitHub doesn't seem to match. Now that the control signals are supposed to have a sane output, let's do a quick sanity check on the ROM data bus. But that doesn't look good at all. <laughs> it's certainly not supposed to be turning halfway on together with our LED. Let's try to see what state it's supposed to be in by printing out DRB, the lines connected to the main control signals. BC43 are the direction and register values in hex. BC sounds fine, but 43 would mean we have both chip enable and output enable active which is what we were trying to avoid. There it is. I forgot to actually save the register. With that in place, we should see something more like, yeah, D3 would mean the ROM isn't outputting and the lower address latch is loading, which I guess is fine. 
Now that we have enough wires hooked up to read any address on the ROM, it might be a good time to write some code to test it out. Since I have a tendency to make mistakes when I write bit masks for flipping bits and don't really appreciate the time it takes to come up with good names for constants and variables, I think now might be a good time for my lab assistant to save us some time. For the uninitiated, bit masks are the binary patterns we use to either set or clear a bit in a register or memory byte on processors that don't have specific instructions for setting or clearing bits. That way, if you want to set a bit, you OR the destination with a constant that only has that bit set, and if you want to clear a bit, you AND the destination with a constant that has every bit except the one you want to clear set. For that reason, you end up with two constants for every bit you want to be able to flip efficiently. And that is tedious to write. So with that in mind, let's leave the task to something that's good at following rules. Other than that, I'd like to explore how useful ChatGPT is for helping with my 6502 assembly programming homework. I will be speeding through a lot of this, but if you want to read all the mostly useful comments from the model, I suggest you slow down YouTube playback speed quite a bit. When I just list the labels from the schematic and the pins they go along with, it looks like the language model knows exactly what I'm after and starts helping with the code. But all I want are some bit masks I can paste into the code, so I ask for those. Now the question is if I can give it enough info to actually write the code to read the ROM. If I feed it info about the latches and the signals, it already starts outputting code, but it doesn't know how DRA works and it doesn't know how to clear the latch. So I also have to specify DRA is only 8 bits and connected to both registers. But it's actually going pretty well. I've saved a bunch of typing and the comments are better than what I tend to put in. It took a few more tries to actually make it successfully set the latch bit, set the address byte in DRA and clear the latch bit for each address register, but it looks okay now. We're also using DRA for receiving and transmitting serial, so let's try to make it consider that too by flipping the direction bit before and after for TX. Now we just need to let the model know about the chip and output enable lines and we should be able to read a byte from the ROM. Except that takes some convincing. Now we actually have something that should work, so let's put it in RAM on the 65 Oino and see if we can read a byte at address 0. It looks like that byte is blank, meaning all the bits are ones, which makes a lot of sense since we erased it in the last video. But let's make sure with our known working programmer by reading it. And yes, that explains the blank byte, so let's try writing something more suited for testing, like the 65 Oino ROM for instance. With that in place, we're still reading FF so I have a feeling we forgot an important detail. Yeah, since we're using the 8-bit port DRA for both input and output, we have to remember to switch the direction register. Output when we use it to send data to the registers and input when we're reading from the ROM. I'm testing the language model a bit to see if it'll extrapolate that it needs to flip the bits in DDRA when I tell it to switch direction for DRA. I don't blame it that it didn't. What happens next is a frustration with ChatGPT I probably wouldn't have if I used the paid version. When the code gets too long, it simply starts to abbreviate or simply throwing away details I already specified earlier. So we're right at the complexity for how long Code Snippets version 3.5 can handle at a time, I guess. There's also quite a bunch of obvious optimizations missing. I guess I could ask the model to give it a try, but it's already starting to make things worse, so I guess I better do it myself. So I guess my lab assistant did technically write the code, but I might have spent more keystrokes getting there than I would have writing the code myself. 
but I do think it looks cleaner than my usual code, so I'll give it that. And overall, maybe it was faster. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's write the raw mattress and see what happens when we run the code. Perfect. D8 read from the ROM. Looks like the AI code does what it's supposed to. Let's check a little bit more with the loop testing the first 5 bytes in ROM. Got 5 bytes, but it looks like we're off by 1 and missed the first D8 byte. Quick fix and run. To make sure that's right, we don't have to pull the ROM, but can just compare it with the listing file. It actually looks like we're one bit off at the third byte. I wonder what that's about. It should be A2, but we read it as B2. That doesn't make much sense. I guess I better make sure it's not the serial line messing with a bit, so I'll just add a resistor that's easy to overcome, but should still allow us to send code but it didn't change much. Maybe I do have to check the ROM code. That's A2 all right, but I guess I can think a bit about this while I feed the robot my optimizations. Since we don't have room for much more code in RAM, now might also be a good time to make this a subroutine instead. But of course we still have that weird bit flip. I guess I better check the connections. Oh, sure enough, there's actually a wire in the wrong place. Let's see what fixing that does. There it is. Perfect. We have an off by one error again, but the bit flip is gone. Now let's try dumping the first page of code for good measure. Yay! Success! Now that we know the code works, let's split out the code to latch the addresses into separate subroutines so we can also use them for other things and keep our code in RAM a bit more compact. And it looks like that's going according to plan. But of course, we're not just building a ROM reader, but an EEPROM burner circuit. So I think it's time we use the control register for something useful. In the last video, we managed to erase the ROM by manually moving wires around and using a little transistor driver circuit to switch the 12 and 14 volts required. But since we want to do that using our microcomputer instead, we need two more drivers, three in total. One for driving the higher voltage to the VPP pin, one to drive the high voltage on A9, and finally a driver to switch the 270 kilo ohm resistor into the regulator feedback, so we can drop the 14 volts down to 12 volts. I have a feeling it'll just barely fit without grabbing another breadboard. For now, I'll check they manually do what they're supposed to and leave them connected low. And it looks like we have 14 volts and 12 volts. Perfect. To see what's going on, let's add a few indicators. Now it's just a matter of hooking the lines up to the control register according to the schematic, and we should have the full software control over the programmer. But note we haven't actually hooked up the transistor drivers to the EEPROM yet, as that might make things a bit toasty since the control register latches to all bits high on reset. Now, to write some code, we can 
once again have the robot do some of the grunt work. Hopefully we don't have to spend more time directing it than we save. Of course, it does very well at generating the bitmasks, because computers are pretty good at math, but let's see what happens if we tell it we're, what we're trying to achieve. Of course, it has no idea the control register is write-only, and it's not a memory map location, but it does seem to get the concept of latching a byte into an external register. I don't know if it's ever worth keeping track of what's in the control register, but for now we can allocate a spot for it anyway. One of the first things we want to do is to confirm the ID of whatever ROM is plugged into the programmer, so we at least don't try erasing or writing to it if it's in the wrong way around or something like that. So let's try to teach the robot how to do that. Since I've already told ChatGPT what pins the signals are on and what they're called, I might just need to give it a few more details about how things work. After feeding it what each signal is supposed to do, I go through a few scenarios to see how much it remembers. I spend quite a while trying to shoehorn it in to output the right code without outright fixing it, it really seems to have a hard time latching onto the fact that an active low signal needs to be cleared to be active. And of course it's programmed to seem eager to please, so it ends up writing gibberish a few times. So, after about 20 minutes of trying to make it fix what would have taken 3 minutes by hand, I give up and correct it myself. A better way in many cases is just to fix the obvious mistakes and feed the corrections back. But after a bit of struggling with the lab assistant, I'm pretty confident we now have some code that'll print out the serial ID of the ROM. But of course, if we run it right now, it just prints out the two first bytes of ROM since we haven't hooked up a 12 volt driver to A9 yet. So let's do that. And if we run the code again, we should see the ID, but that's not it. It should be DA08, but we're reading A583, which is probably what's at address 200 and 201 hex. That's my guess because if A9 isn't pulled all the way up to 12 volts, we'd just be reading the addresses where A9 is a normal high. After a bit of double checking, I found out the robot had switched the bit masks for set and clear for the regulator, but fixing that didn't get us all the way there. Instead, that just seemed to make the 6502 processor crash every time I tried to run the code. And that got me thinking we probably have more of an analog problem here. Since we know the circuit works from the last video where I managed to switch the 12 and 14 volts by hand, this might be a problem with the capacitance on the regulator input. If we immediately start drawing current from the regulator before the output caps have time to charge, we're suddenly expecting more from the regulator than we did before, and it drags down the input voltage up to the point where the 6502 crashes. How do we fix that? Well, we can do it in software by giving the output caps after the regulator more time to charge up after enabling the regulator, or we can do it in hardware by adding more capacitance at the input so the regulator has a harder time pocketing down the whole 5 volt rail. So first I'll throw in a 220 microfarad cap close to the regulator input pin, and that should make the rail less bouncy, and if not I'll try 470. Let's see if that works. Oh, it looked like it didn't read the serial data correctly right there. Let's try again, and... Oh, there it is! I don't know if you missed it because it goes straight to the main loop and I forgot to switch the serial RX pin back to input, but there it was. I bet I can show that in slow motion in post, and if nothing else, that's a pretty quick fix. Before we move on, I'll optimize the code a little bit, since the robot didn't. I can tell it too though. The benefit of having the bit masks as defined constants is that it's easy to combine them at assembly time. So I remind the robot to do just that instead of running multiple instructions to do the same thing. 
I also try to feed back some of my manual changes. Now I think we're ready to get a move on and erase the ROM. So we just tell the robot how to do that and it should come up with some code that's pretty close. Of course it has no idea how the delay routine works, but let's tell it and see if that'll work. But it doesn't seem to account for the fact that a 6502 memory location won't hold a value over 12,000, so we better make a new delay routine it can use. We'll just copy the delay short routine and use the 1k divisor instead of 8. I have to help it along a few times and it seems it's now forgotten the bit masks it made itself a little while ago, but we can just feed those back in. But eventually everyone runs out of patience with machines that aren't quite as helpful as you hope they'll be and I end up writing the nine lines of assembly to erase the ROM myself. And to quickly estimate if the erasure was successful, I just reuse the code to read the first two bytes. Once again, if I run the code now, we should just read the first two bytes like normal since the 14 volts aren't hooked up to the erasure voltage pin. But if we hook it up, we should see a blank ROM when we run it again. But we don't. I take a while to figure out my mistake from earlier and wonder if I messed up the pinout, but eventually realize that my logic is mistaken. At least, A9 also needs to be 14 volts during erasure. So if we add that to our new erasure routine, we should see a change and. FFFF. Those are two blank bytes we're reading. Perfect. And if we throw that into the programmer, we can verify we successfully erased the whole ROM. Amazing. Now, with the ability to read and erase the ROM, we just need one more trick to replace the expensive programmer. Let's see if we can also write the ROM. And that's even simpler than erasing it, since we just have to put 12 volts on the VPP pin, set our desired address and data, and then pulse the chip enable pin low for 100 microseconds. Let's try to write a value of 55 hex and see what that gets us. We can copy most of the code from our erase routine, but of course we need a new delay of 100 microseconds instead of 100 milliseconds. I'm lazy, so I'll just ask the robot what value we need to plug into the delay short routine. Afterwards, we turn off the control signals, disabling the regulator, and we should have written 5.5 somewhere. I've sped up this part because I spend a bit more time than I'm happy to admit on first a stack overflow, I guess underflow since it's a 6502, and then just running out of code space in RAM and then forgetting to load the address registers correctly. But then suddenly, it works. And to make sure it wasn't a fluke, I try a few more times, but it looks like I have the code ready to throw away my expensive TL8662+. Well, not really. It really is a handy tool, and I'm still thinking about getting the newer T48, which I have affiliate linked in the description, since I'll read and program basically anything without much fuzz. But if you just want to program a single $1 ROM for a hobby project, a $50 to $70 programmer is complete overkill. And I imagine this will be just as useful. That's why I took the time to make it. Of course, reading, erasing, and eventually writing a single byte to ROM isn't much of a feat. So I took a bit more time off camera, and as you might notice, I've switched to VS Code. I guess it was either that or switched to Vim forever. Since we only have space for about 100 bytes of code in RAM on the 65 Arduino, I've already made some reasonable subroutines and put them in ROM. If you'd like me to elaborate how I wrote the routines, just ask in the comments or on Discord, and I might make a video on that. For now, just a quick overview of what the code does to make it a programmer. Since we still have a few bits left on the control register, I'm using one to indicate we started the process for debugging and, uh, and the like. 
To make sure we have the right ROM, we start by checking the ID. It expects a 12 volt programmable EEPROM and does put 12 volts on some pins, so you probably don't want to try this with a 5 volt EEPROM. If we verify a W27C512 is connected, we fall through and start erasing the chip. I'm not a huge fan of using too many macros to write assembly since it can make the code completely unreadable, but since we'll be printing quite a few strings, I think we need it. So I put a macro in a separate file and included that up top. We could take the time to verify the ROM is blank, but I've commented that out since we don't really need it. Instead, we clone the internal ROM of the 65OE node to the target and verify all bytes were written correctly and finally print out the address of the first verification failure, which should be at address 1000 hex of the freshly burned ROM. Let's try it out by sending the code via serial and see it in action. This is amazing. I've tried, but I haven't found any way to make the other programmer program less than a whole chip. So every time I do this with Mini Pro, it takes about 30 seconds. So as you can see, this is a crazy improvement at about a second and a half, even without crazy optimizations. If there is a way to make Mini Pro program less than a full chip at a time, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Now, if I just grab this ROM out of the programmer, we have one more way we can test it by replacing it with the one in the 65 Oino. Success! We now have a firmware self replicating 65 Oino. It can now copy its own ROM faster than I can put them in the breadboard. And that is really cool. For me especially, since when I sell the 65 Oino kit with ROMs on my website, I've promised to program the W27C 512s with the newest firmware. And at 30 seconds per chip, this will be much more fun at more like 2 seconds. Now of course we still have some caveats. We still have a chicken and egg problem as we need a ROM with the correct firmware to use the programmer or another computer or microcontroller. Second, that obviously means it's not what we call in-circuit programmable, except for the RAM, of course. I'm pretty sure that could be done with a 5 volt part, like the SST39s and some jump ring, but that's a separate project. Third, we haven't written any code to accept data to burn via serial, instead of just cloning the ROM, so we'll have to get back to that later, but I can promise that's coming. Now, of course, the best part of this is that we aren't limited to just this single type of EEPROM, but can basically program all the vintage ROMs with little or no modification. For instance, this 2764 EPROM just needs 12.5 volts on pin 1. So we can just adjust the regulator voltage a bit, move the programming voltage over to pin 1, and maybe a tiny tweak to our code. Even these 21 volt 2732 ROMs that the TL8662 pluses can't program reliably, by the way, aren't a problem as our regulator can go up to 36 volts. So, fourth caveat Is this the end for this project? Is it done? Absolutely not. It's a working prototype of a super cheap design that we can fiddle with, but we can make it a lot more stable and convenient to make by putting everything on a PCB. That also means components will be even cheaper, and as a shield, it'll work on many different development boards. Not just the 1 MHz 6502 based 65 Oino here, or the AVR based Arduino Uno at 16 MHz, but all the way up to an STM3287 Nucleo board at hundreds of MHz. If we write the code, that is. I wonder what the max speed we can physically program a vintage ROM like this is. We probably don't need an H7. And who knows, maybe I'll get a sponsor to cover the cost again so I can give away a bunch of boards like I did for the 65 Oino itself. Free stuff wouldn't be so bad, would it? Be sure to let me know in the comments if you'd like one of these when I have them made. If you stuck around this long, thanks by the way, you might have noticed that I also cleaned up the code a bit, moved library-like routines into separate files, and simplified the assembly script by putting the serial transmission into a Python script. 
I'd love to elaborate, but this video is already way too long, so that'll have to be another time. You're always welcome to ask on Discord. Hopefully, by the time the next video comes out, I'll already have some PCBs ready to test and maybe even distribute. For now, if you don't have one already, it might be a good time to buy a 65 Arduino kit and some ICs from my store. So you already have one when the Programmer Shield is ready. I promise I also have a lot of other fun projects coming for the 65 Arduino. Either way, thanks for watching.